Hello and welcome to Talking Tudors, a fortnightly podcast about the ever-fascinating Tudor dynasty. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through 16th century England. Are you ready to step through the veil of time into the dazzling and dangerous world of the Tudor court? Without further ado, it's time to talk Tudors. everyone, welcome back to another episode of Talking Tudors. I'm your host, Natalie Gruniger. Thank you so much for joining me. I'd like to begin by acknowledging and thanking the wonderful listeners who continue to support my podcast on Patreon and extend a heartfelt thank you to everyone who's taken the time to rate and review the show. This really does make a difference. If you love the podcast and you never miss an episode, I invite you to join the Talking Tudors patron family. Visit patreon.com slash Talking Tudors for more information. Join the Talking Tudors patron family and in addition to receiving lots of Tudor-themed goodies, you'll have access to patron-only monthly giveaways. February's prize is a copy of the Queen's Frog Prince, The Courtship of Elizabeth I and the Duke of Anjou by David Lee. Thank you so much to the author for sponsoring this wonderful prize. You can also support the podcast and share your love of Tudor history with the world by buying Talking Tudors merchandise. There are a number of designs and products available, including phone cases, mugs, notebooks, and apparel. Check out all the products at talkingtudors.threadless.com. I would love to see pics of you wearing or using your Talking Tudors merch, so please do tag me on social media and use the hashtag ILoveTalkingTudors. Now, on to today's episode. I'm thrilled that joining me on the show to talk about the iconography of Mary I is Peter Stiffel. Peter completed his BA in Medieval and Early Modern History at the University of Chichester in 2019 before joining the Centre for Medieval and Early Modern Studies for his MA in 2020. Peter was co-organiser of MEMS Fest 2020 and chaired a range of panels focusing on the 16th century. Peter's research explores the iconography of Mary I via her portraiture and material culture. He examines the many portraits of the Tudor Queen, as well as exploring imagery surrounding Marian coins, medals and seals. Our conversation's coming up straight after this short musical break, courtesy of guitarist John Sayles. Welcome to Talking Tudors, Peter. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, Natalie. Thank you for inviting me. Yes, I've been looking forward to our chat. So a good place to begin is you just introducing yourself to our listeners and just telling us a little bit about you and your background. Yep, so um, I'm Peter Stafel. I'm currently a PhD student slash researcher at the University of Kent. Um, in my third year now, and I study the iconography of Mary the First. So basically, I just go around the country looking at lots of pretty pictures. Sounds amazing. And and Peter, what makes Mary the First such a fascinating subject? Oh, what doesn't make it fascinating? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I think we we all know the story. She was born a princess. You know, she's the, the pearl of her father and mother's eyes. And then suddenly everything just collapses around her. You know, you have the annulment, you have the entrance of Anne Boleyn and all of the other stepmothers. Mary's made legitimate. She's separated from her mother. 
then had to survive her father's court again dealing with five stepmothers you know some she liked some she didn't like we all know who's who she was then always seen under suspicion by henry and then by her brother edward um even when edward was king she was then this flagship of catholicism you know she was the, st- the stance supporter she was the rock which everyone who followed the old faith would go to you know this new religion well what is this it's completely alien to everyone and then when edward has died you then got jane grow well hang on a minute <laughs> she's then you know she's having the fights well fight for her throne for those 9 12 13 days and then even when she does become queen she then has to return her country to the true faith you know and to be fair most people are on board of that you then obviously have those protestants who aren't um, she then has to deal with court infighting she has to deal with a male court you know we have to remember she's the first woman ever to be crowned queen in England in her own right. She's our first queen regnant and having to deal with 40, 45 privy councillors, all men, her court is male. She's got to find a way around that. She then finally finds happiness with Prince Philip of Spain. She finally thinks, you know, God's on her side. She's going to produce a son and everything's going to be fine. And then obviously, unfortunately, she doesn't actually produce that child. And Philip basically abandons her because he's got to do with his own lands in Spain and the rest of the Spanish empire. So she has the heartbreak of that. And then at the end, she dies childless, knowing everything that she's done in those five years is going to be undone by her sister, Elizabeth. And Elizabeth has always been that constant reminder of Anne Boleyn. She is the result of her parents' breakup. And to see that as to the future, But then again, she put duty first. She didn't decide to change the succession in any way. She allowed the law to be the law of how, you know, the law in succession. Well, that is how it goes. You know, she put personal feelings aside for that final moment. First female monarch. And without her, who knows when we would have had a female one? You know, would we have had Elizabeth? Would we have had Victoria? Would we have had the late queen? When would that transition have started if it hadn't been for Mary? What an excellent summary. And you've just reminded me of why I love this period of history so much, so dramatic and, and so much going on. That was amazing. It it's, like, it's like the soaps. Oh, it is, isn't it? Absolutely. Exactly. So talk to us a little bit about the imagery that emerges after Mary's coronation in 1553. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a few images that spring to mind immediately for us. Um, but I guess the first actual image of her after 1553 is the Bikramas role of that year and I mean luckily you'll be able to see it but unfortunately the viewers won't but lots of people will know about this image it's the famous one where she's seated on a throne it's a beautiful image you know you have her in the golden dress it's a story of her accession basically so here we have we have Mary in the middle she sits on a golden throne she's wielding the sword and the scepter to show her queenship and her kingship because we have to remember she was king and queen and um, the sword symbolizes her herself as a warrior as a judge, clear obviously the scepter shows her queenship. On the left, we have her being proclaimed queen. She's been guided by the angels. They're telling her, you know, it's just now your time. I sort of like to call this this image the accession image, and it's sort of like the assumption as well, because she's guided by the angels, like the Virgin Mary was guided by the angel Gabriel, saying, you know, you are now the mother of the kingdom, mother of the air, mother of the Messiah. On the right, you have what we believe is the Northumberland uprising. Um, you have Northumberland's army, you have Mary's army. You see Northumberland putting his arms up in the air. He surrendered. You, you have the weapons thrown onto the ground. It's her military victory, very much like her grandmother, Isabella. You know, she is this warrior queen. You then have, obviously, Mary seated in, the, seated in the middle. She's wearing her coronation gown. She's wearing the imperial crown. You have the two angels guiding her. And you have the dove above, the Holy Spirit. She's God's anointed queen. She's the true successor of Henry VIII and Edward VI. She's the virgin queen. But with these images, you have to also remember the literature that's happening at the same time. So Robert Winfield's Vita Maria, which discusses this whole event, the succession crisis, shall we say. And he calls Mary sacred, holy queen. And he even goes and suggests that, you know, she inspired a reverence from only which only God could rival. She had that power. You know, I guess it's sort of what we just had with the late queen. She is God's anointed. And there's that special power, that special link between God herself 
and her subjects. And then John Seaton also writes, and so does William Forrest in his ballad, the new ballad, The Marigold. They continue to emphasise Mary's sacred nature. She's seen as a virgin, which she clearly is, she's not married yet, the legitimate and true successor, not only of the crown, but of the faith. You know, they want to pretend that the Reformation didn't actually happen. She is the, the continual candidate. You know, you have obviously Henry VII and then Henry VIII before he goes a bit crazy. And then you have Mary. So this is basically the only image of 5053 that we have, because all of the later ones are either very early 1554 or later on. But unfortunately, obviously, not a lot of people would have seen this image. So I guess the most common image of her really would have been the coins. And I know we'll talk about that maybe a bit later, but I just want to show you this. So this would have been her first coinage. This is a silver groat dated 1553 to 54. Obviously, you have the queen on the obverse. She's wearing an imperial crown. She's wearing loose hair to suggest her virginity. She has a cross necklace. Maybe the cross that Catherine of Aragon once wore. We, you know, obviously, we don't know. But it's, it's nice to think of that symbolism. You obviously have her name, Maria Regina. And if you actually look at some of the um, stamp marks, there's actually a pomegranate. So we know this was made in the London Mint. And whichever mint, this, the workshop in this mint used the pomegranate. So is that sort of Spanish link, that sort of remembrance of her family. Obviously, on the, the reverse, you have her motto, Veritas Temporis Filia. Truth is the daughter of time. And then obviously, you've got the co English coat of arms. So there's that, always that link to truth. She's the tr daughter of truth. And only time will be able to judge her for that. Yeah, that's wonderful. I know when I've shown the first image that, that you were talking about before, people have kind of said, that's not Mary, that's got to be Elizabeth, because of obviously the, the very fair, quite fair hair and the colouring. Mm -hmm. It's like people don't associate that with Mary, but rather with Elizabeth. Yeah, no, it's definitely Mary. <laughs> yeah, I know, I like saying that's that to people. No, that is, that is yeah. Mary. <laughs> it's nice to see that whole scene. That you, know, you can tell the whole story through just that one image. Yeah. It it's is very fascinating. Powerful. And I will share some of these on social media so people can see them. Yes, no, glad um, And so in terms of portraits, because I love 16th century portraits, I'm always looking for them and looking through, <laughs> you know, the galleries, the online galleries. So what um, portraits were commissioned during Mary's reign? I guess the first one, the official portrait, shall we say, of the reign, was actually by the Netherlandish artist Hans Ewerth, and it's dated between 50, well, early 1554. Um, so it's actually quite a significant portrait. So this is one a lot of people should know. It's obviously, it's not as famous as Antonius Moore. She's obviously wearing a lovely golden gown, show her wealth, show her stability. You have a pillar next to her, a pillar of Hercules, which is sometimes used by the Habsburgs to symbolise strength and stability. So she's a strength, you know, a stable ruler. You obviously have the cross, which I was talking about earlier on the coin, which may have been Catherine of Aragon's. Obviously, we can't really prove it, but it is nice to think that that's... That is Catherine's. So it's her, showing her Catholic faith. She's a Catholic queen, she's a Catholic success, successor. You have what some people call the La Peregrina. It's not the La Peregrina, but it's that Spanish pendant, which we believe was given to her by Charles V, her future father-in-law, and her betrothal of Prince Philip of Spain. So it's the Spanish link. However, there's also a diamond, which was given to her by the king of the Romans, King Ferdinand, Charles's brother. So it may also be that when you know we we can't tell which one it is, so we like to think it is just Charles and Phillips. So again, it's in her, you know, her Spanish inheritance. She's she is half Spanish after all. If we look at the rings now, this is very important, and Hans Eworth always shows Mary with this number of rings, and in this way. If we look, she wears a lovely spousal ring which she was given at her coronation, and they're all diamond rings, as far as we're aware. So it's shown her wealth and her marriage to England. Below her, by her girdle, you have a reliquary, which used to belong to Henry VI, and also her father. And it was said to contain the, uh, a relic of the true cross and some, some bones, some relics from St. Thomas and St. Catherine. Now, we're not quite sure which St. Thomas and St. Catherine they were, but it sort of does sort of highlight, maybe she's using the relics, not only to show her faith, but also as protection. You know, she's asking for these saints' intercession for their assistance for her rule. So we know this portrait was painted around, you know, the early 1554 because she's wearing a lot of fur. Now, what's interesting is, obviously, I'm sure some of your viewers will know about Tom, uh, 
Wyatt's Rebellion in January and February of 1554. Now, was this portrait an afterthought after that rebellion? Is this a portrait to show that she is the queen? You know, you must respect her. And we, you know, we do know about that guilt or speech when she talks about herself as a mother of England, you know, whether a a mother doth love a child, so I, your sovereign, doth and love and favour you. She's making that link between motherhood and the crown and England. She is the mother of England. She is the epitome of Tudor society. And we also have to look at that portrait as well. It's the feminine version of Henry's Holbein portrait. Whereas Henry has his hands on his hips, you've got the codpiece, the wide, the wide stance. So does Mary with that dress. The dress fills the room, fills that panel. She's also a triangular notion. And that triangular notion makes your eyes focus onto her womb. It's where her hands are placed where they are. She is the vessel for the new, the next heir, the new Messiah, shall we say. So that's a really, you know, I, lo- I do love that portrait. And I was lucky enough to see it a couple of months ago. And it's, if you get a chance to see it in real life, please go and see it because it's absolutely gorgeous. And images really don't do it justice. So I guess we should move on to the, the most famous portrait of her. Everyone knows what this portrait looks like. Um, it's by Antonius Moore, again, a never, Neverlandish artist who worked for Charles V and Philip. Now, a lot of people think, oh, you know, this shows Bloody Mary. She's cruel. She's haggard. She's old. She's, she's intolerant. Well, actually, this portrait shows a lot more than that. Yes, you could have those arguments. But if we actually look closely, and I love this fact about this portrait. I only realised it a few years ago. She's actually the only Tudor to smile in her portrait. It's a, it's a very hint, uh, small smile. Yes, yeah, very but subtle. There is but a, very... There, there's a very subtle smirk. It's a sort of, she's enjoying this. Hmm. She's sort of shown her human side, so obviously the crown, because that crown is that hybrid between the divine and human. Again, she's wearing what we like to call a Spanish pendant or La Peregrina for those you know that way. So it's shown her Spanish inheritance, also her Spanish future. We know this portrait's painted after the marriage because she's wearing her wedding ring. But what's interesting is, is that her spousal ring, the diamond ring here, it's closer to her heart. It's on her wedding finger because the the, the Tudor belief was that the vein on that finger went directly to the heart. So the fact that the spousal ring is on there first shows that she's not going to just do what Philip says. She's not going to be that subordinate wife. She is queen first and wife second. It's a beautiful portrait, it really is. And obviously you then have the Tudor rose, well, the red rose to show her ancestry. Also to show betrothal, her love, her love for her husband. But what's interesting is that this portrait was obviously the ownership of Charles V. So this is the Spanish version of it. However, there are a couple of English versions which are very interesting. So if we look at the Marquess of Northampton's collection, I mean, most people would think, oh, it's, it's the same image. But if you look closely... There's no wedding ring. It's been taken off. Why is it not there? I mean, it could just be a mistake, maybe, but it seems quite a weird mistake to make because yeah. everything else is basically the same. You then have the same in the Isabel and Street Museum. Now, this was Mary's own copy. This was gifted to St. Francis Jerenum in 1557 by Mary. Again, same image. You know, we'd think it's the same. No wedding ring. The fact that there's two portraits, contemporary portraits of her, that don't have the wedding ring, I think that's suggesting something. Yes, I think <laughs> so. <too. laughs> <laughs> What's going on? Is it Mary saying, I mean, it could have been maybe portraits before the marriage, maybe, but we know more wasn't in the country till November, December 1544, or when Philip arrived. So he would have painted her as a married woman. The fact that the wedding rings aren't there means that they've been taken off and they're not there on purpose. It's to show her as a queen, not as a wife. So, yeah, no, so there is, you know, even though we know these two famous portraits, there are a couple of things. Oh, hang on a minute. What's going on here? We don't notice that before. Yeah, that was such an interesting analysis. I actually have looked at those portraits so many times and have missed so much of what you said. So thank you so much. I need to now look really closely at them after this so I can examine that. Um, So I know you also like to look at medals, which are fascinating as well. So tell us about the medals that were made depicting Mary and what the designs tell us about how she wanted to be presented to her subjects. Gladly. So again, I think this medal, a lot of people may know, um, but those who don't, it's designed by the Italian uh, Jacopo de Trezzo. Um, it's 
made around 1554. And obviously you have the obverse, uh, Mary is depicted with her titles. She's Queen of England, France and Ireland, defender of the faith. On the reverse, you have her depicted as peace. She sets fire to the instruments of war. She saves her people from heresy. The legend attached, Zivis Visus Timidus, means sight to the blind, peace to the timid, or to the quiet. It shows that she's saving her Catholic supporters, her Catholic subjects, from the evils of heresy. She's bringing them back to peace. Uh, we think this must have been made before Philip, because there's no inclusion of him whatsoever. He's not even named. And Mary doesn't include her Spanish titles either. So when she married Philip, she became Queen of Naples and Queen of Jerusalem, to name just a couple. And they're not mentioned here at all. It's just her as Queen of England, France and Ireland. So we believe it is made just before the marriage. The figures on the right could represent her people under the tyranny of Protestant rule, seen with the winds of reform. You can clearly see there's quite a blustery scene here and people <laughs> aren't very happy. Behind her is the Tree of Life. This maybe suggests her fertility. Her rule is seen as England bearing new fruit. Again, her role as motherhood. She's the fruit tree. As with the Virgin who bore the Messiah, so Mary has the opportunity to bear an English Catholic heir. Behind her, on the left, are figures rejoicing in sunlight. They're the faithful who obviously stuck with Rome. And some scholars believe this temple is the Roman temple of Janus, the Roman god of duality. Sort of, it does links with her because she's obviously both monarch and human, king and queen, that whole dual concept. However, this wasn't the only medal produced. I mean, and this medal, again, this one is of gold, but they were also made in bronze and silver as well. So a wide variety of people would have had the opportunity to buy one or were given one. This next one, again, designed about 54. Um, this is around the date of the marriage negotiations, or maybe it's a, perhaps a celebration of that, this marriage. Um, the re reverse shows union, the mistress of affairs, and highlights the need of England to unite with Spain and to celebrate the Habsburg marriage. Now, this may be peace and it may be union. It's quite debatable who this is. Um, but whoever they are, they're holding a torch between two olive branches in her right hand and a crown is held in her left. The figure walks across a battlefield. Again, there's that, that emphasis of warriorship. She's a warrior queen. As peace, Mary united England and rules over a kingdom, which is peaceful. Her olive branches highlights her intentions. She wants to be a peaceful monarch. She doesn't want any more blood spilt. She's a specific ruler and is shown to have good government. If the figure's union, then clearly it's shown that her and Philip will preside over a peaceful Europe. Their marriage will unify two kingdoms. So that's Dad Trezo, and a lot of people, some, you know, they, he's one of the most famous ones people know about. However, there is another one, Jacques John Henlink, and I've completely butchered that name. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know what these, these names are like. Um, but he was a he was inspired by um, Dad Trezzo, and he created a similar sort of medal, again, showing their union. So you have Mary on the obverse, Philip on the reverse. Now, Natalie, you may be asking, oh, how do you know which side's which? Well, <laughs> I mean, that's a very valid question. <laughs> but after looking at some of Philip's other medals with his other wives, which are very similar in this design, Philip's normally facing where Mary is. So I'm such, I, I think Mary's the dominant figure in this, in this medal anyway. Because why would Philip portray himself on his wife's side for all of his other wives? It, it doesn't make sense. Um, so Mary's on the other verse, Philip's on the reverse for this argument. So Jacques began his service to the king in 1555, and he was a royal seal engraver. Uh, I already said it, he's inspired by Trezzo, and this medal shows them in bust form. It's very probable that this medal was cast to celebrate Mer Philip and Mary's new roles as king and queen of Spain. Now we know this must have been dated maybe 50, 56, 57, because obviously on Philip's side, you see he's called King of Spain, his Rex. So he, we know he's now King. Charles has abdicated at this point. So Mary is now Queen of England, France, Ireland, Spain, Naples, Jerusalem, Dukes and Duchesses, you know, the whole lot. We have to also remember that she's not just an English queen, she's a very European queen. As I always said, she takes a dominant position. And as I've already said, it's because of the wives. So yes, again, the, all of these medals were cast in gold, silver and bronze. So a, a wide variety of people would have seen these. They would have been sent to courts, maybe to advisors, friends, supporters, you know, 
we'll never know how many actually was made to send to these people. But they just show it. There's a at least an understanding that the power of medals and obviously other material culture they're used to symbolise. This is what the queen looks like. This is what the king looks like. This is their union. This is how it's going to be. It's going to be a Catholic utopia, the new Isabel and Ferdinand, maybe. Yeah, and so wonderful looking at them up close because you get to see all that fabulous detail in the the clothing and everything. It's amazing. So I know that coins were also a very important form of material culture. So can you tell us a little bit about why they were such an important form of imagery and why they were used by royalty? I gladly can. So coinage is vital, you know, as the late Queen's motto was, I have to be seen to be believed. And especially during the 16th century, because people wouldn't have seen their monarch very often. You know, you may have seen their procession in London or some other city, but you wouldn't have been able to see them as often as we do our royalty now. So coins, medals, charters, that's the only time you're actually going to see an image of the monarch. And obviously the coins are going to be the most common place because everyone will have a coin. You know, the general populace, they might have a shilling, groat, penny. Those wealthy enough may have a gold sovereign. Or maybe if you were invited to the Maundy Thursday ceremony or washing of the feet, obviously then that's a very intimate connection to, with your monarch. And we know Mary was a very supporter of that. So obviously how these designs were made would symbolise Mary's government. You know, if they portray her young, youthful, it shows stability, growth. So this gold rile is a beautiful coin. Um, you have the ship of England. You have Mary as its captain. Again, she's holding the sword. It's a very male image. Um, this image was actually used for a lot of her predecessors. But also she's the first female to be, be, be presented on this ship. Uh, the ship's England. Um, she's the captain. She is steering her ship across the choppy wards of reform and the, the 16th century situation at the time. If we look at the reverse, the legend, and it's, I mean, you might, you should know this. Um, <laughs> this is Elizabeth's, Elizabeth's very famous quoted um, Psalm 118. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvellous in our eye. We all credit Elizabeth for that wonderful scene <laughs> under the oak tree when she's <laughs> proclaimed <Yes>. queen. <laughs> well, <laughs> Mary was there first with this Mary point. was there first, I like that. <laughs> and, you know, again, it, it works well. She, you know, no one thought she was going to become queen. And here she is, 1553. She's finally succeeded in her divine rights. She's chosen to lead her people against the sea of heresy that's engulfed her kingdom. She's the new Virgin Mary. She's the new Eve. However, obviously, a lot of people wouldn't have had this coin because it's gold. But many people would have had a silver groat. Obviously, we've spoken about this before. But thanks to lockdown and due to a bit of boredom and also being locked at, locked at home all week, <laughs> that's right. I actually... <laughs> Silly me decided, obviously, I can't go and see these coins. So what I'll do is I'll go and buy one. Oh, you bought one. <laughs> Fantastic. So I do have one. And it's, it's you know, gorgeous image. You know, you really do feel you're part of that 16th century when you actually see the image. And it, it's a very well image, you know, very well done. And you can still see the queen's face. But yes, so the groats, obviously the most common type, well, one of the most common types. Um, there are two distinct designs. Um, obviously, the first one we've just discussed uh, designed about 53, 54. It shows her in profile. I sort of see her as a very Roman ruler. She looks yeah. very Roman and imperial in that. Um, obviously, her flowing hair is there, so she's the virgin. However, there was a second design, and it's sort of a similar image, but not quite. On this one, she looks a bit smaller. She looks a bit older, maybe a bit wiser, maybe a bit not as stable. We're not quite sure. But what you will see is that Philip is mentioned. Philip's name is on this, so we know this dates after her marriage in 54. What's interesting is that Philip's not on it. There's no profile of him. You've still just got Mary, but Philip is acknowledged as the husband of the queen, the king. Both designs show as an imperial empress. She wears the closed crown, so you can her independence and her power. And even though she's married to Philip at this stage, she's still shown with loose hair. So she's still trying to portray herself as this virgin, this virgin queen. Very interesting image. That is. I don't know if I've seen that one before, so that's really interesting. <laughs> yes, no, it's a, it is very, very odd. You know, you don't wonder what, why they still got her with the loose hair, because yeah. she's mad at this point. And, you know, they don't make those sort of mistakes often. But if we look at one of the pennies, there's a lovely silver penny. 
And again, it sort of shares the same image. But what's interesting is that, again, Philip's not on it. And this would have been the most common image of her. So the fact that they've not got Philip on it again, is there a reason for this? You'll notice that the gown is tight fitting. She's wearing a different gown for this one. It's not an open neck. It's not loose. It's very closed. So it's showing her and she's wearing a decorated partlet. So she's showing that she's a married woman now, but she still has her loose hair. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's that whole contradiction. What you notice is that there's a hole being punctured. Now, we don't know when this hole was made. You know, it could have been done you know, a few decades ago. It could have been done centuries ago. It could have been done when it was made. But it shows the, ma- the material aspect of coins. You know, they weren't just used as payments. Mm-hmm. Some people use them as medallions, as good luck charms. You know, was this coin used as a medallion, necklace, good, good luck charm? Was it to show a sign of support for the, the monarch? And we know, because the hole has not been done on her face, it's not done out of malice. So it's not an attack on her authority. It's simply used maybe as a memento or some sort of spiritual connection with the queen. If we look at the legend on the obverse, it says, Maria de Gracia, Rosa Sinispina. So Mary, by the grace of God, rose without a form. Now, for all those who know the Bible and biblical tales, the rose without a form is a very common name for the Virgin Mary. So this legend makes a direct link with her. Yes, this this reverse was used for her predecessors, but none of them were ever a female and none of them were ever called Mary. So this link with the Virgin and the Queen has been cemented with this coin. And again, this is the most numerous coin that people are going to have. And the link with the Virgin, with the rose and without a form, has been around since the 5th century. So there's that cemented idea of virginity, saviourhood, protector. It's a very interesting coin. And I mean, it is one of my favourites, actually, because it shows that someone has interacted with this coin. And again, because it's a silver penny, so everyone would have had a penny at some point. The fact that you're using this image and this legend, perhaps subconsciously people are thinking, oh, Yes, she is actually going to save the kingdom because of what she's doing at the time as well. Yeah, it's interesting. You're you're speaking and I'm thinking about, obviously, Elizabeth was so inspired by Mary, clearly, mm. and a lot of the things that we credit to Elizabeth, that whole imagery <laughs> of motherhood and protectorship and is, of course, you know, Mary's work, really, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yes. No, I mean, I like, to, I like to tell people, oh, you know that Tilbury speech? Yes, the <laughs> one that she may not, she may have done, she may not have done. Well, you know... If you actually compare it to Mary's Guildhall speech yes. five years, you know, a few years late earlier, it's very similar, isn't it? It is very oh, similar. Mother, mother, right. mother of my people, I'll protect you. It's like word for word. So, oh, I wonder where she got that inspiration. From. Yeah, that's true. so interesting. So, so Peter, Mary also used illuminations on the on Chief Justice's plea rolls and other places uh, to emphasize her royal status. So, do you want to tell us about maybe one or two of these images? Because I think they're yes. quite fascinating. Yes, no, they're gorgeous, aren't they? So we've obviously done the first one, the 53 Michael yes. So if we look at just a couple. So this one is from 1554. It's the Michael Mass roll. It's the first one made after the marriage. So we see Mary and Mary is on the, the dominant side. Philip's on the, in the consort position. They're both wearing individual crowns to symbolise their independence from each other. Philip holds the sword. You know, that's a... A lot of people think, oh, because he's wearing the sword, he's holding the sword, he must be the dominant one in charge. Well, no, it's just because he's the man. He's meant to be the warrior. He's meant to protect his queen. Mary doesn't need to have the sword because she's the anointed queen. She's had her battle with Jane, you know, with Northumberland and Jane Grey. She's won that. She doesn't need to show that anymore. She's holding the scepter. Now, the scepter is the more important part because obviously that's the sign of royalty. She's the anointed queen. And again, even though they're married, She's still wearing loose hair. <laughs> She's yeah. still trying to see, portray herself as this virgin queen. And she noticed they're also wearing different colours. Mary's wearing red parliament robes, whereas Philip's just wearing gold robes. Now, gold may be maybe the colour of Spain, symbol of Spain, maybe of his wealth, of his power. But she's wearing the parliament ro- roles, robes. So she's, in terms of parliament, she's the law bringer. She's the one in charge. He receives his power from her because she's holding the king's scepter. Because we know the queen's scepter is normally depicted with a dove. And this isn't a dove, this is more of a fleur de lis sort of scepter. 
so even though he's holding the sword, it's only got military symbolism. It's not really that important. So this one from Hillary, 1555. Unfortunately, it's not illuminated, Natalie. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, that's they're okay. not all <laughs> they're not all illuminated, which is really a, a depressing. But you know, they obviously had to save money somewhere. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you notice the simply iconography has changed. None of them are wearing crowns now. The crown is above them both. Philip's bareheaded. Mary's wearing the French headdress. She's wearing usual fashion. Um, on the top is it's Revent Rex at, at Regina. Now you notice the Rex is first. Well, that's sort of the compromise that they made. You know, Mary is in charge, but in terms of official documents, we'll have Philip's name on top uh, in front because both Philip and Gardner said it's unnatural for a woman's name to be placed first. How wrong they were. But, yes. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's just the, bod the, the same body is the same pattern from the previous roles. They've just slightly adapted it. They do look quite youthful, actually. It's that, you, you know, that youthful couple, that, that new breath of fresh air. They're the new Isabel and Ferdinand. And obviously the joint crown sort of echoes that. And then again, this is the first image of them with just that single crown. Now, for 1557, obviously now we have to think, oh, right, now they're king and queen of Spain. And they're queen of the other institution, other countries and lands. So this isn't quite a king's bench role, but it is a charter. And it's the first charter of 1557, dated 15th of February. Again, she's wearing the same outfit from the 56 rolls, and she's still on our let, she's still in the dominant position, even when you know 57. Well, Philip's Queen of Spain at this point, she's Queen of Spain, she's still in that dominant position, even though the year earlier in the Mikamas, the 56 roll, they swap positions. So it's very interesting. Um, obviously, she's holding the scepter again, Philip's holding the sword, she's still wearing red, he's gold. So it shows her as judge and lawmaker. He's just wealth. But there's a very interesting illustration. So yes, now if we just roll back a year to 56, what's happened? They've swapped positions. Ah, yes. Philip's now on the dominant side. Mary's on the consort side, shall we say. Well, this is clearly because he's now king of Spain. When it comes to England versus the Spanish Empire, <laughs> you know what what case what takes precedence mm, all right we'll we'll give you this for it we'll, you know because you know a lot of people wouldn't have seen these these are mostly just for the law courts it's just to appease him even though he might not have actually seen these it's to sort of symbolize that he is now king of spain and she's queen of spain and you, know, you can't really doubt that and she not she wouldn't have doubted it either you know she knew King of Spain, well, that's obviously takes priority over. We're just England. We're not that important. But fast forwarding back to 57, we have this charter. Very beautiful. Very stunning. interesting. They're not sharing the crown anymore. They're both, again, independently crowned. She's, he's wearing gold. She's wearing red. Again, the loose, she's still wearing that loose hair, even though we know she was wearing a hood in the previous years. Whoever's designed this, which may be living a turning, but not quite sure yet. But it's shown, you know, she's still that anointed queen. Because a lot of people make this argument, when Philip's presented on the dominant side, he's now in charge. But he's never holding the scepter. He's always just holding a sword. She's the one holding the scepter at all times. She's the dominant party in this. Um, obviously, then you have the cloth of a state and the throne, and it shows the general pattern. Again, Virat Rex at Regina. But the fact that she's wearing her own crown, it's, it's going back to that 54 Mikamash role, where they're shown as independent partners. I like to think this is sort of an image Isabel and Ferdinand would have used. Unfortunately, I've not found any Spanish charters with images, which is really frustrating. Oh, that's, so I'd, yeah. lo I'd love to have seen if Isabel and Ferdinand had this sort of same idea. But I don't think the Spanish really illuminated their charters and manuscripts. So we have this lovely charter. The final King's Bench role, shall we say, Yes, no, this is King's Bench Roll. Uh, 1558, it's actually their final depiction. It's the Trinity Term Roll. Again, nothing's changed. They've gone back to the previous design. He's wore, Well, he's now wearing a hat. She's wearing French hood. You've got the, the crown in the middle. If you notice, the crown is actually closer to Mary. Not to <laughs> it's her. closer to Mary, yes. <laughs> it's, it's a lot closer. And Philip's looking at Mary. Again, his power comes through her. Yeah. She's the one wielding the scepter, the, the orb. He's just wearing the sword. So yeah, no, and I have found in my research, there was a lot of 
to and fro in where do we put Philip? Where do we put Mary? Oh, yeah. Sometimes Philip's in. Sometimes Philip's in his own illumination. Mary's squashed in the middle somewhere. Sometimes it's Mary's on dominant side. Sometimes Philip's on dominant side. So there's this constant. Ooh, where do we actually put them? There is a bit of confusion, or maybe it's just that battle. Who is actually the dominant one? Yeah. Where are we going to place our loyalties? So yeah, yeah. that's the quick run through <laughs> some of the roles and charts. So it's a whole chat. Is really interesting. Wow, amazing! And so, in in all your research, Peter, and all the images you've looked at and everything you've seen, what are those symbols that you've found? And you've talked about them, but but what do you think are the main symbols that you found associated most often with Mary? So the main two are the pomegranate and obviously the Tudor rose. Obviously, both sides of her family. You've got yeah. the uh, Spanish pomegranate from Granada, used by Catherine. Also used by Isabel of Castile. And then you have the Tudor Rose, obviously, by her father, just to show her legitimacy. But I have noticed she uses the fleur de lis a lot. Now, I mean, it might just be because we still have that claim over France at this point, perhaps. But you also have to remember the fleur de lis is also very much linked to the Virgin Mary as well. So is there a link there as well? I mean, you know, maybe. Yeah. We can't put too much emphasis on that. But yes, no, they're the three main symbols, the rose, pomegranate, and the fleur de lis, which sort of makes sense for who she is. Absolutely. And you spoke earlier about the fact that Mary was, of course, not just a, a Tudor queen, but she was a European queen as well. So how is she, how is Mary depicted in Europe? And and how did they circulate her image there? Was it similar ways to how it was circulated in England as well? Yeah, so we'll answer the second bit first, because that's probably easier. Um, <laughs> yes, I mean, Antonius Moore and Hansi were obviously Netherlandish. They did go back to the Netherlands every so often to see their families and whatnot. And obviously the Spanish court was traveling. Um, but there are a couple of ones which I just want to go through. Um, one's in Antwerp and one's in Budapest. Why there? Who, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, from my understanding and from the contemporary art history on Carol von Monde, who wrote in the late 16th century, early 17th century, I think. And he spoke to people who knew Antonius Moore and they say, that after Moore painted Mary and his initial drawings and sketches, he then sent a lot of copies of her head, uh, the drawings of her head, not actually <laughs> the drawings of her head, to members of the Golden Fleece of Spain. So it's also the equivalent of the Order, the order of the Garter here. And he also sent them to Cardinal de Granville, who was a leading Habsburg statesman at the time under Charles and Philip. So this is probably how these collections have become a thing because they've been given to members of the Golden Fleece and then right. they've either sold them or given them to these museums. So here's a lovely, lovely one from Antwerp. So it's very smooth. It's a very smooth depiction of her. So whoever owned this portrait, you know, this is how Mary looked at them. Very similar to ours, but obviously she has been maybe photoshopped a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> she's got a filter on, but, doesn't she? That's what she exactly. <laughs> she's definitely got it. She's got that grey and white filter on Snapchat. That's what it is. <laughs> and, but what's interesting about this portrait is actually She's depicted with brown eyes. So clearly, who it can't have been Moore. Well, I hope it wasn't Moore who painted this because yeah. he knew that she had blue eyes. And in his portrait, she is with blue eyes. So whoever copied this clearly didn't meet her because they got the wrong colour's eyes. But it is quite common, actually, because a lot of portraits, because there's that one at Hampton Court with the family, and she's painted with brown eyes. And you think, well, hang on a minute. She's got blue eyes. Elizabeth is the one with brown eyes and she's painted with blue eyes. So <laughs> they've, they've mixed them up. <laughs> How's this happened? But this one is um, from Budapest. Very similar, very similar design. She does look a bit more realistic in this, a bit older. And she's not wearing a very decorated um, partlet, whereas the other one was very decorated. This one's very plain. It's sort of, this is, you know, he's, this is just an image of the Queen for whoever owned, used to own it. But however... Before we go into some more European depictions, there is one that I should have mentioned earlier. Um, so this was by Hans Eworth, painted 1557 is the traditional date for it. Um, it may have been 56, we're not quite sure, but it's very interesting because in this portrait, she's obviously, she's seen as queen. She's wearing the gloves for fem femininity. She's wearing, she's holding a warrant for Thomas Hungard. So, which is why we think it's about 1557, because that's when this warrant's dated. However, she's wearing very similar clothing to Philip in that famous Titian portrait. Is this her version of that to accompany Philip's portraits? They're both wearing Spanish clothes. They're both wearing the same outfits. This is her 
and him becoming one body, one monarch. They are the new Isabel and Ferdinand. At this point, you know, the, her- the religious legislation is working perfectly. It's working. She's at the peak of her power. She's queen of all of these dominions. Is this meant to be a, a double portrait? Maybe. It does seem like there's, there's something missing from it. Where's Philip? Um, but yes, no, it's a very, I love this portrait. I really do. The fact that it shows that she is the new Isabella of Castile. She really is. And also, just a quick point, there is a portrait of her entitled Queen of Chile. Now, yeah, yeah, exactly. What? Why is it in Chile? What? <laughs> well, obviously, because the Spanish owned Chile at, at that point. However, it's been lost and no one knows what it looks like. And it's really frustrating. For me oh, gosh, I'm... we need to find it if anyone knows where it is. So, if anyone knows, it was in Santiago in the 60s. Wow. And apparently I contacted the museum and they said, oh, no, it's not actually ours. It was in a private English collection. Oh. So if anyone has been to an aristocrat's home and they've <laughs> seen it, it's called um, Maria Regina Chile. So mm-hmm. it's a very simple inscription. Okay. It's been inscribed. So if anyone knows where this portrait <laughs> is or knows anyone who knows someone, please contact me so I can see this piece. Because <laughs> I'm very intrigued to see if it is actually her. How fascinating. Anyway, going, it is. It's, I mean, it's, I just couldn't believe it when I read this. Like, what? There's, there's one in Chile, or there was one in, of her Queen of Chile. The only depiction of her as Queen of Chile. Wow. Okay. Which no one, you know, again, we don't think of her as that. No. She's a not. very inter- she's a very international figure. But anyway, going back to European depictions, there are these lovely stained glass windows in the Netherlands and Belgium. Well, nowadays Belgium and Netherlands, the low countries, shall we say. So the first one is at Saint Janskursk in Gouda, and it was met, created in 1557. It was designed by the Wouter brothers, Derek and Wouter, uh, Derek and Wouter Krabbe, sorry. Um, created during 57 and it's a it was created uh, well commissioned by Philip and Mary after the war with France so that famous battle in 57 where they destroyed the French forces this is a celebration of Habsburg enterprise just before it all went wrong it's a beautiful image it's 20 meters high this window it's massive I haven't got the whole image here because it's just it's too big I mean we don't need to look at all of it because most of it's about Philip being the new Solomon. It's a glorified propagandist for Philip, basically. But a lot of people don't know that Mary's actually in this portrait as well. As you can see, she's on the concert site. You know, she's behind her husband, which is fair enough because this is in Gouda. This is her, her husband's territories. He is the king there. She wears a golden farangale, blue underskirt, very Virgin Mary colours. The Virgin's always portrayed in gold or blue. She has a brooch depicted in St. George. So she's shown her English queenship. She's Queen of England as well. She takes a submissive role, but as I've said before, it's because Gouda's her husband's land space. It's not really her. She's inherited them through marriage. They both gaze at the Last Supper. They're shown their piety and their success in returning England to the true faith. It's a gorgeous image. I mean, people have written books and books about this. It's really gorgeous. You know, we have one of the apostles, perhaps St. John, welcoming them into the Last Supper. You know, and it's, we just spend a few moments just, you know, how many times do we see Mary depicted like this? We oh, don't. It's extraordinary. But I this, haven't seen this one, Peter, so this is really exciting. Have you not? Oh, well, yeah, oh. no, you know, it is, this is what the citizens of Gouda would have seen it pictured her as. We don't know why she's like this. Why didn't they use the depictions on the coins? Why didn't they use the Antonis Moore depictions or the Hans Ewer portraits? We don't, you know, we just don't know because they were around. They could have used but they chose to to picture us this it's you know it's gorgeous they're both wearing the same crowns so it's that unity they're both wearing similar colors they're both in prayer it's shown her party she's got she's got tudor roses he's wearing the golden fleece so they're both so i mean because she did was technically all of the garter but obviously she never actually took part in the ceremonies because she was a woman but it's symbolizing they're both the two chivalric orders however this wasn't the only window created that year the year previously or just before in 1556 there was a lovely one commissioned by philip and mary at the church of saint barbara in ghent now unfortunately i don't have an image of the actual window but i do have a draw a picture of the cartoon or the vidimas the initial stages of the design these windows suggest that there's a valid attempt to put across the couple for the united territories again they're in that prayer position 
They're giving thanks to God for their success. They're both wearing high imperial crowns, very close crowns. She's wearing this lovely gown. And I think if we can read some of the inscriptions, it's, you know, that she's in, she's going to be wearing purple. She's going to be wearing furs. She's very much decorated as a queen of England. She actually looks more decorated than Philip, actually. <laughs> so yes, that's another does. argument. Yes, looks like <laughs> she, she looks a lot more royal. <laughs> I never noticed that before until now. So, so this one's from Gouda, uh, 1556. I'm hopefully going to visit her and see what this actual window looks like because I'm fascinated to see what it actually looks like. And then we have another one. Now, I've got a full drawing and I've also got part of a window for us to examine. Again, you know, look at it. She's next to the Virgin Mary and the Christ child. I mean, the symbolism is staring you right in the face. You have Philip on your opposite side. You know, they're giving praise to God for their unity. So this is part of what the window looks like. Obviously, she looks a little bit older. She's very, again, look at what, how she's depicted. She's with the Virgin. She's with the Christ child. Philip's with one of the saints. It's very much, she's the Virgin. She's that vessel for England. And people may say, oh, how do you know it's Mary? How do, well, actually, well, I mean, this image isn't the greatest, but if you actually look at her altar, well, where she's praying, it does actually have the English coat of arms. And if we look at this later drawing of it, Again, you have the Tudor rose and you have the coat of arms. So we know it is her. And you have the joint one, the marriage one here. And it got PM, you know, <laughs> so there's no <laughs> arguing about it. Um, they're, they are here. So she seems to face forward while her husband gazes upwards. Um, the one at Antwerp, which was designed by Cornelius van Dahl, we clearly see, you know, there is some inspiration here. They're all working together. They're showing her with the virgin. She's a mother which is emphasised as a mother. She sends a new virgin, which will bring that new heir to England. The virgin's her sponsor and protects her and will intercede on the Queen's behalf to her son. And the iconography may also reference England's place as the virgin's dowry. Um, it's a very old tradition that the virgin, the England was bespoed, bespoed to the virgin as her dowry. And we've actually just recommissioned England as rededicating the as, as virgin's dowry a couple of years ago. So that's fascinating. In terms of like European image, you know, she's seen as this, she's a wonderful figure. I mean, even in Spain today, they still call her Mary the Magnificent, or Mary, you know, Me wonderful Mary. You know, there's a tube station, metro station named after her. You know, you'd never get that here. The fact that they've named a metro station after her, it's like, you know, I want to go to Madrid just to see this metro station. <laughs> just to go out at that station. <laughs> just to go out there, say, look, this is Mary. So, um, well, I guess the final images of her, really, and this is, we sort of touched on this before, but they are the seals. Now, for those who don't know the importance of the seal is the symbol of mon the monarch's power. You know, you can't have any old thing stamped with this. You know, you have lots of various seals. You have exchequer seals, the great seal, common different court seals. But we're just going to focus on two images. And there's actually quite a funny story about the seal process. Um, so obviously we have the first seal shows very similar to that Mikamas roll. You have the throne, you have the, the queen seated on it. I mean, it's not the best quality but you know they are 500 years old we've got to give them a bit of credit it just has her as mary queen of england france and ireland defender of the faith now what's interesting is this seal the first seal wasn't actually made until her marriage treaty so this seal that i'm showing natalie now is from the marriage treaty <laughs> between england and spain un unifying them and also you know it's got lovely golden thread clearly because it's the marriage treaty it's the most important document of her reign in terms of spanish influence um yeah so you know it's shown her as a unified queen very important figure clearly after the marriage people are thinking oh we should really put the kin on it as well shouldn't we and you think oh you know that happened in 54 it didn't they didn't actually start this, the privy council didn't start discussing it until 1556 so it's two years after the marriage oh maybe we should start oh maybe we should clearly because he's now king of spain at this point and it's sort of a bit of an insult that you're not yes. included <laughs> so then you obviously have that famous one with them both on horseback she's in front he's sometimes people argue that he's the more important one because he's in the center yes but no but he's looking at her his horse is bowing to her you know it's quite obvious she's the dominant partner in that. and she again she's holding the scepter that seal wasn't actually made till 1557 so it's quite a gap. I mean, yes, it takes time to make these things, but the fact that they weren't discussed until 50, the year before, it's very interesting. So we always thought, oh, they're just two seals. This is the final one. 
it might not be because there's this a drawing in the British Museum dated 1558. A lot of people used to think it was Elizabeth. Yes, well, I, reasons, can, I can see why. Yeah, I can, I see, can why. see why. Yeah, but the face but, is, is definitely Mary, isn't it? It's definitely Mary, and again, you've got the Spanish pendant, you've got the pearl, you've got the cross. So this is definitely Mary. Where's Philip gone? He's, He's gone. You know, <laughs> no acknowledgement at all. This is Mary bringing back her own independence, her own power. You know, she knows Philip's abandoned her. He's not coming back. Stuff him. Why should we have him on the seal? We, we, you know, yeah. I and the Queen bring her back into the full image. Was this seal ever made? We don't know. I mean, there are some arguments saying that it was just a drawing. It wasn't actually made at all. Some people think, oh, you know, the fact that it's a drawing, maybe we just wasn't enough time for it. So it's very interesting, actually, this image. And I, I love this is one of my favourites because this shows her at the height of her power. A lot of people think 57, 58 were the downfall. You know, they were stunned. It was all yeah. going wrong because there was no more heretics being burnt. Well, the fact that there's no more heretics being burnt, well, that means it's worse. It's working out there. Not more people are being, you yeah. know, they're being, no one's been arrested. Yes, all right, we lost Calais, but it was a drain on resources. And not a lot of people actually thought, well, you know, stuff it. You know, it's an expense that we don't need at the time of economic turmoil. They blamed her for the harvest failures and the weather. Well, you can't blame the weather. It's not, she can't control, you know. No, exactly. She, yeah. might, she, might, she might think she's a demigod, but she's not God. <laughs> she can't control the weather. Um, so, you know, and it was only those last few months when it really just went downhill because of her health and yeah. failed pregnancies, which is, you know, you can imagine what it does to someone now, never mind someone in that situation back then when you, you couldn't, you couldn't tell until the very last moment. So, yeah, you know, the iconography shows mary is she is england england is her she is england that relationship between crown and monarch and her subjects is all unified she is god's representative that final image was she just looked magnificent didn't she and i look forward to sharing that with everyone so because that is <laughs> such a different portrayal to the one we often get of the kind of you know yeah. old uh, haggard you know yeah. not very impressive no one ever woman. sees it <laughs> yeah amazing amazing so i've got just Two quick other questions for you, Peter. I've got a group of wonderful people who support this podcast on Patreon, and I often like to ask them if they've got any, you know, burning questions. And so I've got a couple for you. One of those was just if you could comment on your view on Mary and Elizabeth's relationship. We'll start with that one. Yes. No, it's a, it's very, a complex one, isn't it? <laughs> it's a very complex question, isn't it? <laughs> you know, obviously we have the whole narrative. It's the hate of Sheva. Well, we know to begin with that yes she was that remind that constant reminder of her father's betrayal of her mother and her but it wasn't elizabeth's fault you know it's not her fault that she was born and she did look after her as a young princess and as a child and you know and it's what i loved about becoming elizabeth actually I and mean, a lot of people didn't like it because they betrayed elizabeth and it's, you know we all know the reasons for it yeah. but i loved it because it's well, this is the Mary and Edward show. This is great. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it was becoming Mary, becoming Elizabeth. But you do have that relationship between Mary and Elizabeth in that, in those scenes. Mary is the older sister, but she's also trying, she is the mother figure. She's yes. telling Elizabeth, look, if you've done something wrong, don't tell me because I will use it against you at some point if I need to. You know, I'd rather just be ignorant. So they're very complex. I mean, you know, I think she tried having a relationship with Elizabeth. Where Elizabeth tried having one with Mary, I don't, you know, I'm not in a position to argue one way or another. But I guess the real problems were to, uh, Wyatt's rebellion. The fact that she was implicated, whether or not she was, you know, we don't know. She probably wasn't, but people used her as an excuse. But once you know that your own sister's plotting against you, you can't trust her ever. You can't trust her ever, ever again, especially from who, whose daughter she was, Mary we all know Mary did not like Anne Boleyn for obvious reasons. Whether Anne Boleyn likes her, you know, we don't know. <laughs> but <laughs> and we need to ask them. How... Yes, no, it's a very complex relationship. You know, I don't blame Mary for not liking Elizabeth if she didn't. Because I think we would all be in that, under that situation. You know, yeah. you're a princess to begin. You're always brought up as a princess. You said, you know, gonna, you're going to marry some foreign prince. You're going to become queen of some country, if not queen yourself or England and then suddenly you're just demoted yeah. nothing that you ever had is it's all gone never mind the reformation your whole country's falling apart around you and you're all your fingers well this is my father's fault 
this is this woman's fault. This woman has seduced my father. Now this girl is now princess. And I'm, how am I not princess? I am princess. Yeah, so it's a very complex relationship. You know, I'd like to think they try to make bridges, yeah. and I'm sure yeah. they did. But then once you have that implication in 54, it's, she'll always respect her as a sister, but you can't trust her. But then again, on, when I, on her deathbed, she left. She didn't have to leave it to Elizabeth. She could have chosen Margaret Douglas or someone else, but she knew that she put duty first and she thought, no, yes, she's the daughter of my enemy, but she is my father's daughter. You know, she is legitimate in some ways. So she put duty first and obviously then you had Gloriana. Wonderful. And, and the other question is, of course, in regards to the executions during Mary's reign. So do you feel, one of my lovely patrons wanted to know whether you feel that she sanctioned these because she actually really believed that this was God's work that she was doing and that this was, you know, ridding the country of the so-called heretics. Um, is that why, why you feel she, she did what she did? So I'm going to split this up into two arguments because obviously okay. heretics and traitors are very separate yes. at this point yep. in terms of the heretics yeah she had no sympathy whatsoever you know yeah. she they were evil in her eyes and you have to remember at that point if you weren't catholic or protestant you if you're on the other side you were going to hell the reason they were doing what they were doing was trying to save you from hell it was sort of yeah. trying to save your soul and if you actually read some of the the accounts of those trials some of these people were given three, four, five chances. Agnes, stop doing what you're doing. No, I can't keep, I'm, I'll promise I'll be good. Well, why have you done it the week after? You know, stop doing it. Yeah. <laughs> but everyone was very entrenched in what they believe in. And we have to remember, some of those who were executed under Mary would have been executed under Edward and Henry. They were Anabaptists. They were so radical. And they were confident in their radicalism because they thought, oh, it's just, it's Mary. You know, if we're going to die, we're going to die anyway. And a lot of people seem to forget, well, it wasn't just Anglicans, if we want to call them that, or evangelicals. They were and they were strict Calvinists, you know, even worse. Than, you know, So they would have been executed anyway. And again, you had four or five chances. But to Mary, no, she had no sympathy whatsoever. And you also have to remember, it wasn't, she may have brought back the law, but the law had only been repealed under Edward. Henry had it, and all of his predecessors had it. Yes, a lot more people used it, but you have to think, well, is it due to religion or is it just due to personal grievances? You know, look at the bishops. The bishops have excuses. Well, that's because you kits out the Catholic bishops in the first place. So the Catholic bishops are having their revenge. You know, and it happened the same under Elizabeth and Edward. You know, obviously Elizabeth, they executed them instead, hundred and quartered them instead. Yes, no. So in terms of the heresy, Mary had no no regrets at all because in terms of what she was doing, she was, it was working. You know, like I said, 57, 58, the numbers were going down. So something's working or people are just being quiet. That, you know, they've now realised they're not going to stop until they have all gone. In terms of traitors, it's very difficult because she was actually, well, again, a lot of people think, oh, she's the bloody queen. She goes and kills everyone. She was actually accused of being too merciful. Once you have Northumberland's rebellion and White's rebellion, she pardons half the conspirators. Why are you doing that? You know, Charles writes to her, says you need to put a firm stand, kill them all. But Mary doesn't. She gives them the benefit of doubt. She gives them, you know, Northumberland was allowed to live. Well, no, um, you know, the Greys, they weren't, yes, they were arrested for treason, they were sentenced to death, but they weren't actually killed until Wyatt. So it's Wyatt's fault. And Jane Grey's father, you know, if he, Henry Grey hadn't risen up again, Jane probably would have survived. Yes, she would have been in the tower and maybe eventually she may have been released, but it's her father's fault that what happened happened. And we know Mary didn't want to kill Jane. You know, she knew she was she was just a pawn in her father and father's games. And it was only because the Spanish said, look, Philip's not coming until Jane is dead because she's a threat. And you have to remember, she can't be human. She has to be monarch. What monarch, you have to take decisions whether you like them or not whether people agree with them or not they have to be hard decisions because you have to keep the, the crown must survive doesn't matter about personal feelings especially back then you know even now the crown takes precedence and it's sort of similar to you know elizabeth and mary queen of scots 
why should Mary be accused of butchery and be painted as this evil figure for ex executing Jane Grey? But then Elizabeth's glorified for executing Mary, Queen of Scots, who was actually a queen. Yes. <laughs> you know, she wasn't just a, she wasn't just a member of the aristocracy. She was a queen in her own right in Scotland. So you know they're either both bad for mm. killing these people, or they're both good, or there's that very great area. Yeah. You know they're both good, and you know obviously you wouldn't do it nowadays, but back then you had to ensure your survival. And the only way to ensure your survival was to ensure you didn't have any anyone as a threat. You know that's why Gardner wanted Elizabeth executed, but Mary would. You know that was a step too far. I'm not going to murder my own sister. Whether or not I like her or not, that's not the point. It's my <laughs> sister. She's the daughter of my father. I can't, you know, and she completely refused to do it, even though people were begging her, you've got to do it. You killed Jane Grey, do it to Elizabeth. And she must have had just had, had hindsight, said, no, I, I can't. She's my own sister. Blood is thicker than water and most, most of the time. Well, thank you. It was so wonderful to hear your thoughts and all that other incredible information about the images. I really enjoyed that. There's just one other thing that we do, Peter, on the on these episodes at the end, and that's what I call 10 to go. So these are just 10 quick questions just to get to know you a little bit better. So number one, what was the last book that you read? Actually, it was a book I was reviewing. Um, it's called Portraits of Cardinals. It was actually a very interesting book. It's all about portraits of um the whole idea, not just about the portrait and stuff, but the whole idea of why she paint, uh, paint cardinals, who's who's commissioned in these. It's not always the cardinals themselves; it's their patrons or their friends or those who wish to have favour with these cardinals. So yes, no, it's a very very good book actually. It's very interesting. Wonderful. And what about a favourite holiday destination for you? I'd love to go somewhere sunny with a beach. <laughs> Maybe Australia. I mean, you I'd should love to come go. to Australia. I yeah, would, we're, I'd we're love sunny to now. Go. Yeah, I'd love, honestly, if it wasn't for the big spiders, I'd love to come. <laughs> yes, lots of things that can harm you, but it's okay. It's a lovely country. That's fine. Um, <laughs> what about a film that you've, and it doesn't have to be a, a period film, it can be anything, a film that you've watched more than once that you go back to? Or maybe a series if you watch, watch yeah, the series. Yeah, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say a film and a TV series. Actually, no, I'll say two t TV series. I mean, Becoming Elizabeth is one of them. Because I love just how Mary's portrayed in it, I absolutely adore it. Magnificent, um, Mary. Enough, yeah. But yeah, she is. But I've actually I've just um, started season five of The Crown. Oh right, yes. Um, but I do prefer the first two seasons. I won't. I won't lie. So yeah. I like watching the first two seasons. I sort of skip the other two because it's, <laughs> you know, it's, too, it's modern day. No, this is no. Wait, stop. Exactly. I remember too this. modern. Too modern. <laughs> this, this didn't happen. I like nineteen <laughs> fifties. 1940s, you know, Me too. where royalty was still seen as that divine institution. I mean, it still is, but you know, obviously, you know, King George VI and Queen Mary, the late Queen's grand, the King's great grandmother, you know, stance with monarchists. You know, this is how things are done. So I always watch the first two seasons over and over again. Wonderful. Okay. And what about an ideal Saturday night for you? What does that involve? Well, if I wasn't working Saturdays, <laughs> it would be love. It would be lovely just to. Either just go out somewhere, go and you know, go on a day trip, just spend the evening at a pub or something. Just yeah, nice. going into a lovely old pub. That's what I like because I like to look at all of the old timber frames and they always have port like printed portraits of they random do, yes. random people. And I like I like I always there is actually this there's this pub in somewhere here, and it's named after Mary. <laughs> so oh. I want to go. I want to go there to see what it's like. Lovely. All right. Sounds good. And what about a new skill that you would like to learn if you had the time to learn another oh, skill? What would it be? I would I would love to be able to be bilingual. I do study a little bit of Latin, but I'm terrible. I would love to be able to just read these documents without any help, just read them and be able to speak French, Spanish, Italian. I'd love to be able to do that. And I, I think it is a it's a skill a lot of us have now lost because we don't. We're, not, we're just not taught it. We're not educated yeah. in that way anymore, which is really unfortunate. Yes, all right, everyone does speak English, but I always feel guilty when I've gone to Paris and I've gone to, I went to Florence a few years ago. I felt really guilty. I was like, no, I want to speak Italian. I yes. To, yeah, yeah. At, le at least order my food. <laughs> Say please and thank you in Italian. And I, I always try to do that. Yes. And you had people speaking, just speak English. Well, well no, because I feel bad. Yeah. Because <laughs> we expect you to speak English here. So, so I want to speak your language. So what about a subject that you wish you knew more about? It could be any any subject at all. 
I do like ancient history. I really do. You know, I love ancient Egypt and the Aztecs. And I remember doing, you know, we did obviously stuff at school, but I'd love to know more about that. And what do you do? You obviously study a lot, work a lot. So what do you do to relax and just unwind a little bit? I visit Hampton Court. Oh, <laughs> my favourite so, place. I mean, sorry, I know. <laughs> Don't want to get you jealous, but yeah. No, oh, lucky you. Because, I mean, where I am, it's so easy to get to. So I could just go there for the day. Oh. Obviously, because I'm a member of free entry, just yeah. wander through the gardens. Because the gardens are fantastic. Yeah. You know, it doesn't matter what time of year you go. There's always something there. You can just, just admire the gardens. Or you've got Richmond Park just across the road. And just have a nice walk, you know. Yeah. whether it's on your own or with people i always prefer with people because then you can say oh so and so did this here and here yes you know, especially <laughs> you when, you, when you go to, when you go into, when you go into the great hall in hampton court i always feel i'm in the tudor court and i always get i always get quite emotional because you, you know all those big events happened there it's where they were especially in the chapel because yeah. you know this is where they definitely were every day you know even you know mary i always like to sit where i think mary would have or Catherine would have sat or any any sort of historical place because I just like looking at the paintings. Absolutely. <laughs> Thinking, oh, who, I know I know who that is. Or like the National Portrait Gallery. Actually, I always go there, and people always say, "Oh, don't take me there because you start ranting about so and so." So, yeah, but you need to know about these people. You know, this is <laughs> this person's having an affair with this person at this point. Um, there actually one funny story there. It was a few years ago, and I went, I went with my brother, and we I did all the tutor. I said, "This is this person. This is a traitor. This traitor. This, tra- this person was executed. This person was burnt." Oh, stop doing that! I don't want to do it. Fine, we're going to the Stuart bit because I don't really know a lot. Of, I know <laughs> little, you know, the, the main bit. Anyway, we, we walked in and you had James the first and James James sixth in the middle. You had Anne of Denmark on one side, and you had George Villiers, Duke of Buckingham, on the other side. Now, for those who don't know the story, it's basically a love triangle. Wow. You got the king's wife, and then you have the king's um, fancy man. And I just, I just laughed because. It, They've done this on purpose. For those who know the story, it's, yes. it's hilarious. There, you got this love triangle together. Um, but yeah, National Portrait Gallery. Any historic I, I totally agree with you. And what genre of music do you enjoy? Maybe it's more than one, but if you're like oh, me, it's very difficult. When I'm studying, I sort of just like listen to soundtracks. Right. Um, yeah. like the the Becoming Elizabeth or the Tudors. I love those two soundtracks, and I sort of just I sort of get into the mood then when I'm writing or researching. Or if I'm out and about, I sort of, I just listen to whatever. I'm not really strict on a certain thing. I mean, and very last question: a person who inspires you, but you're not allowed to say Mary the First. Sorry, it has to be another person who inspires you. I'd say the late Queen. She was. I mean, I was at the funeral when I went to the all of the ceremonies there, and it was so powerful. I went into Westminster Hall, and also as a student historian, you'd think, oh, you know, look, this is Westminster Hall. This is where. The death secrets were signed, and weren't you? But I couldn't focus on that at that point because I was, I saw the coffin, and I can't describe what I saw, but because it was not magical, but very dignified, and mm-hmm. you got that sense of power of the monarch and monarch as a whole. It's why we do it so well. And you do think, oh, this is what the Tudors, the Stuarts, and all those other houses, this is what it was like. They are demigods. But yeah, no, I mean, the late queen was such a big part of duty. Duty comes first before all else. You know, it doesn't matter if you're feeling ill that day, you go and do it. But I guess a more historic, I love Thomas More and John Fisher, because even though, yes, you know, like they had their rights and their wrongs, when it came to their faith and their belief, they, they stuck to it. They wouldn't shy away like Gardner and Tunstall. They say, no, you've gone too far this time, Henry. And we have to remember, they were very good friends thomas more and henry were very good friends very good allies and john fisher was his got you know henry's godfather so they were very close to him and the fact that he could just he got rid of them it was sort of killing the part of him i think i think those two apart from Catherine, were the last bits of his old self before it all went horribly wrong for him and he had to remove that because he wanted to portray this new beginning new king new wife new daughter this i must get rid of the past and those two figures apart from Catherine and Mary were standing in his way you had all these new men you had Wolsey was gone his parents had gone those two were the last and again like we come to those decisions monarchs make you have to make those hard decisions to 
for what well, he thought saving the crown. Obviously, it did a lot worse than that. Um, but yeah, no, Thomas More and John Fisher, they really were. You know, I went because in Canterbury, we do have his head. It's buried in one of the churches there. Right, yes, I and, remember reading yes. that. Yes, no, it's, I mean, we, but you can't see it because it's in Margaret, it's in his daughter's vault. But just knowing that he's, you know, the rest of him is in the tower, but his head's here, you know, the intelligent part, the spiritual bit is, is, is very moving, actually. Very moving. One final thing, Peter, you've been so generous with your time today. Thank you. <laughs> but one final thing is just the Tudor takeaway. So something for our listeners to go off and explore after the episode. So do you have a Tudor takeaway for us? You've had loads of suggestions over the years and I loved every single one of them. So I, w- I won't repeat anything because I was like, oh, yes, I would recommend. Oh, no, they've already done that. They've done that. I would say Abe Books. Now, you, it's like there is a UK web, UK address and it's also a .com address. So everyone can use it. If you want cheap old books, go there because it is a gold mine. It really is. Um, and I'm looking at my library now and half, the, well, actually, Three quarters of the books I bought from there. You can get calendar of state papers there, proof of council accounts there, old Victorian volumes of the letters written, diaries, and even if you can't get the old state papers, you can get. Um, there's this lovely company in, in India which um, they reprint those calendars, and I've got a couple, of, and it's all leather volumes as well, and they're really good. It's very good quality actually. I mean, I've got the Venetian state papers via that. Because I, I can't read on screens. I have to read the physical page. And it's, it's really remarkable. I mean, and it, you get bargains as well. I mean, clearly some people don't know what they're selling. Because <laughs> I, got, I got 12 volumes of the Privy Council Acts. And normally these are, you know, 40 euro, 40 dollars, 40 pounds a volume. I think I got 12 volumes for 20 dollars. Wow, pounds. that is a bargain. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I read it and I thought, no, this can't be right. Surely... <laughs> I'll risk it. I'll do it. Anyway, a couple of weeks later, this massive box turns up. I think, what on earth is this? <gasps> all of Henry's Privy Council Acts, all of Edward's, all of Mary's, half of Elizabeth's. What? what? <laughs> what? <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I've got that at my uni- university office now because my, my room's just too small for it. But, I yes, no, it. go to abe, abebooks.co.uk or .com. Yeah, I've definitely used it myself, so I totally agree with you. And I'm just laughing at the things that us Tudor history lovers buy, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean yeah who, why not no have all the acts in our house <laughs> yeah read the actual acts and states because because then you can actually double check or oh, handle this is for instance this exactly. old like this, this, this. Yeah. well hang on a minute they didn't say that yeah. and, i mean half of them mistranslated anyway but that's why we're here to retranslate them and say well actually that's mary it. didn't philip didn't say yeah that it was just a burden he was actually distraught because he had just lost his father and his aunt in the same week or same month. I was like, uh, yeah. she was surprised he didn't have a breakdown, actually. Exactly. No, I love it. All right. Well, Peter, thank you so much for coming onto the show and talking Tudors with us. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Natalie. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Talking Tudors. Thank you so much for joining us. I absolutely love to hear from listeners, so if you have any comments or suggestions or just want to say hi, please get in touch with me via my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, where you'll also find show notes for today's episode. If you've enjoyed the show, please share the podcast with friends and family, and don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. I also invite you to join our Talking Tudors podcast group on Facebook, where you can interact with other Tudor history lovers and hear all the behind the scenes news. You'll also find me on Twitter. My handle is on the Tudor Trail and on Instagram as the most happy 78. It's time now for us to re enter the modern world. As always, I look forward to talking Tudors with you again very soon. <music>